Would you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in our sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Thirteen words. Last week in our series, we tackled ten words, and today it's thirteen. Which thirteen? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Again, you might notice that language barrier that we talked about last week with the use of the word thy. And now <clears throat> one of our children did remember what thy means, but can you tell me? Your, yes. We also see another word that showed up last week, the word heaven. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But first, I want us to focus on this tiny word, thy. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You see, at the core of this prayer, at the core of Jesus' ministry and life, is a focus not on oneself, but on what God is doing. It's not about establishing my own power or my own authority or my own kingdom, but God's. It's not about executing my own will, my own desires, my own dreams, but God's. When we pray, it is not about convincing God to do things our way, but asking God to help make God's ways our ways. The first line of this section is, thy kingdom come. Now this might seem a little foreign to us, this idea of kingdom, since we do not live in a kingdom. We do not have a king or a queen or even the ones that we know of, like the Queen of England. She doesn't function as a true sovereign over her kingdom. She's more like a figurehead. So we have to do a little work to translate this idea of kingdom into our world. Now what's interesting here is that when Jesus taught his disciples this prayer, they actually probably had a different understanding of this line than even we do. And that's and even what Jesus would have meant because they, at that point, would have believed that the Messiah would bring about an earthly kingdom, like the one that King David ruled over from Jerusalem. So when those disciples prayed, thy kingdom come, they probably meant it literally. But we know that the kingdom that Jesus was referring to was the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of God is anywhere that God's will is done, where people have accepted the new life in Christ and are living according to its laws and its guidelines. And that's a very different kind of kingdom. It is not a kingdom with boundary lines and property and a castle. Rather, it's a movement where people can join any time and from anywhere. When Jesus began to preach the gospel, he wasn't actually preaching about his death and resurrection and the forgiveness of our sins. Rather, when Jesus preached the good news, it was about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven having come near. Jesus was inaugurating this new way of life where the first would be last and the last would be first, where people would find healing and wholeness and belonging in ways that they had never experienced before. Any time that we have a God moment or see God working in the life of someone or in the life of the community, we are seeing the kingdom of God and we're seeing that kingdom move and grow. So this kingdom that we pray for has come. It's already come. It came long ago, but it's not everywhere. It's already here, but it still has room to grow. We call this already, but not yet. The kingdom is already here, but not yet come into its fullness. Scripture tells us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And on that day, the kingdom will come into its fullness. But we can experience it now. 
We can be part of the kingdom of God now in this life, in this very moment. But we also pray for it to continually come, to keep spreading, to keep growing. That's why we say, thy kingdom come. We are asking for it to keep coming, to keep spreading, and to really allow us to be a part of that work. And when we are a part of the work, we become part of the kingdom ourselves. And when we do that, we make God's will our own, and we make Jesus our Lord. You see, we call this the Lord's Prayer because we call on Jesus as our Lord. And this is what it means to make Jesus our Lord. It means that we put Jesus in charge. We let Jesus be Lord and we let God be God of our lives. It means we let them call the shots. We let them guide us and lead us to a fulfilled kind of life rather than constantly being at odds with God because we want to do what we want to do rather than doing what God wants us to do. Whenever Benjamin, our four-year-old, has to do something like brush his teeth, or get ready for bed, he says, I just want to do what I want to do, Mom. Has any of you heard this before? I mean, isn't that the truth? Isn't that something we can all relate to? I just want to do what I want to do, which I can tell you, a four-year-old, what they want to do is never what their mom wants them to be doing. This prayer reminds us that our lives should reflect what God wants. Thy will be done, not my will. We see Jesus modeled this in his own life most vividly on the night in which he was betrayed. As he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, we are told that he prayed to God, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Jesus didn't want to suffer. None of us do. But ultimately, he knew that God's will and God's way were ultimately what he wanted as well. You might think, well, God would want me to be happy and want me to do what I want because what I want is what will make me happy. Yes, God does desire the best for you, but I think that's a great reason to trust God's will for your life. Romans 8, 28 says, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so when your will and God's will seem to be at odds with each other, perhaps, just perhaps, it's your will that needs adjusting. Perhaps the thing you want in that moment is not going to give you the happiness or the joy that you think it will. Now, I've shared this story before, but it's a lesson that I <coughs> keep having to learn throughout my life. So I knew at a very young age that God was calling me to a life of service in some capacity. Whether I wanted to admit that or not, in most days, I did not want to admit it, not even to myself. And as I got older and got more involved in my faith, I went through confirmation and I went off to college, <clears throat> and I had this mantra for myself. I will go to seminary, but I will not become a pastor. I even trained my parents to say it. They'd say, what is Katie up to? <laughs> well, she's in seminary, but she's not going to be a pastor. That was, that was <laughs> literally, that was the theme of my life, because I thought that in doing what God wanted me to do, I would have a boring, <coughs> a terrible, limited kind of life. <coughs> I believed that if I became a pastor, I wouldn't be able to do all the fun things that I saw everyone else do. I wouldn't have the kind of life that would make me happy. This is what I believed. <coughs> And then I was at camp one night and I finally accepted God's will that I was to become a pastor. 
And I remember sitting in the pew, just like you are sitting there, at the chapel at Lake Ponset, and thinking, I have to give up all my dreams and all my desires to God. <coughs> I, I really thought that's what I had to do. If I'm going to say yes to this, I have to give up any hope that I have for my life. Because I thought saying yes to God meant saying no to finding a husband and having a family. I thought it meant saying no to having incredible experiences and living my best life. And I cried about it, like a lot. But what I didn't understand then was that I wasn't really giving up on those things. I was putting them into God's hands. I was letting God take control of my life. And I found out <coughs> God's a lot better author of my life than I ever would have been. When I began to follow God's will for my life instead of insisting that I knew best, I ended up with the things that I truly desired. I met and fell in love with my husband after I was a pastor. We got married after I was a pastor. We had children after I was a pastor. I've traveled. <coughs> I've met wonderful people. I've got to be a part of some really meaningful events and conversations and studies. All of it because I said yes to God, not in spite of it. Today, these young people have chosen to say yes to God, not knowing what God has in store for them. But I know from my own experience that living for God's will opened up a door to a much better and much more fulfilled life than I could have dreamed of on my own. So I don't want you to let the unknown scare you, but trust that the God who created you with the wants and desires that you have is the same God who will author the best version of your life. If you let him lead you and guide you. You might think on some days that God is crazy, and I will tell you, I certainly have. But in time, you will find that if you put God's will first, you will be exactly where you need to be, doing exactly what you need to be doing. So we pray, God, your will be done. Another way we could say it would be, God, help me do your will, or even better, help us to do your will. Because this prayer isn't just about me. It's about all of us together. God, help us to do your will in all things, on earth as it is in heaven. You see, our ultimate hope and our ultimate prayer is that one day there is only heaven, only the kingdom of heaven that exists. And as Christians, when we talk about furthering the kingdom of heaven, we mean modeling our life on earth according to the teachings of Jesus according to the will of God. We pray that life here on earth will look more and more like heaven, just like we hope through the work of the Holy Spirit that each of us begin to reflect more and more the heart of Jesus. Scripture gives us glimpses of what heaven is like, and it's a reality without war. It's a reality without violence, without pain, without suffering, without hunger, without thirst, without sin, and without evil. It's a place where we all know the love and presence of God and live out love toward one another. It is where the kingdom of God has no bounds because all are a part of it. As United Methodists, we have a mission statement where we share with every United Methodist church in the world and it says, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And that transformation comes directly out of this prayer to make earth more and more into heaven, to make heaven more and more of a reality right here on earth. Heaven isn't just about where you go when you die. It is about living in God's presence here and now. Today, we are blessed to welcome these six young people into the kingdom of heaven as fellow workers and children of God. Let us all recommit ourselves to doing the work of the kingdom, to live according to God's will and to make our little corner of the earth look and feel more and more like heaven each day. 
Amen.